You mentioned physical therapy at school. Is there homework when it comes to physical therapy? Absolutely. Like anything else, you need to reinforce what you do. If you just went to like lecture, like med school, you went to right. lecture, went home and was like, all right, see you at test time. Yeah. <laughs> That wouldn't really work out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't imagine it would. Yeah. But that's the thing. You have to make it part of your day. And the biggest thing with patients who have had a stroke is to make things functional. Don't just sit there. Yes, there's a place for just strengthening where you do reps. But make things functional. Make it so that they can see themselves doing something that they want to be doing outside of your office. And I'm your co-host, Jason Wallen. All right, so today we're gonna uh, be a little different. And uh, you know, we always talk about disease pathology, the treatments that we implement, patient stories. Uh, we bring here physicians uh, and sometimes patients to discuss those diseases. But you know, a lot of what we do has to, has to do with the after effects of our treatment or of the disease, and that is rehabilitation. So a lot of these patients um, that, we, that we take care of will end up with some sort of deficit, especially if they're having a stroke or a ruptured brain aneurysm, uh, and there's some sort of brain injury involved. And in those cases, the most important aspect of recovery has to do with rehabilitation and getting your strength back, your ability to speak back, and, and getting you uh, back into life. And uh, a lot of that is credited, of course, to rehabilitation experts, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, docs that do uh, physical uh, medicine rehabilitation. Uh, so all these folks, and uh, we wanted to talk about it. I know we're getting a lot of questions from you guys about it. And who better to talk about that um, than a physical therapist? And uh, we have one of our favorites here. Uh, Gary's here. Gary, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, Gary's a doctor of physical therapy and uh, as, as such, very knowledgeable in everything physical therapy. And he's practicing physical therapy. That's the most important thing. He takes care of yes. patients every day uh, and a lot of our patients too. Um, and uh, well, it's our pleasure to have you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it's a, I, I must admit, it's a topic I know uh, very few things about, despite the fact that I take care of stroke patients all the time. And I tell them that, you know, rehabilitation is very important. I see the impact of rehabilitation, yeah. uh, but I, I don't really know much about it. So I'm very, very interested in learning more today from you. Oh, thank you. Happy to talk about it. All right. So, so maybe let's start with, um, with something general. Um, tell me a little bit about what role physical therapists play in stroke rehab? Well, they're really there from like the beginning, pretty much and a part of their lives going forward. Okay. A lot of times, what happens, right away, you want to get, once the patient is stabilized, of course, you want to try to return to function. You want to try to build these more or less pathways where the patient's almost relearning. Because they've had, a, you know, in some cases, a massive injury. Right. And for the first time since they were infants, they got to relearn how to use parts of their body. They got to learn how to use it in alternate ways. And then they have to stay with it because otherwise things will deteriorate, skill sets will deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Things that were pretty much innate and you could do them without even thinking now become a concerted effort. Right. And if you don't continually like reinforce those things, then the patient starts to lose the ability to do those things independently. And that's usually a patient's biggest fear after something like that is right. their level of independence. Right. Yeah. So so you're saying stick with it. Is there is there a time that somebody can graduate from physical therapy or is it something and I guess it depends probably on the level of initial function, but is there something that for the rest of their life they'll be doing to some extent? It really does become almost like school where you start out in the hospital. You start out with one type of physical therapist or one level of care and one level of activity. But there's always new ways to challenge somebody. Most of the time, the patient wants to keep going. It's the therapist that usually has to say, okay, we need to take a break. It's not usually right. the patient who says, I'm done, I'm tired, this is good enough. Right. A patient wants to keep going. They want to see results. And the biggest thing that a therapist can do is to point out like the little victories. And that lets a patient know that there is a light. There is progress to be had. They're not done. Right. It's like, hey, remember a month ago, I had to help you up. Right. I had to guard you every single time. Now you stand up by yourself. I don't even worry about it. Yeah, and you mentioned physical therapy at school. Is there homework when it comes to physical therapy? Absolutely. Like anything else, you need to reinforce what you do. If you just went to like lecture, like med school, if you went to right. lecture, went home, and was like, all right, see you at test time. Yeah. Mm. 
That wouldn't really work out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't imagine it would. Yeah. But that's the thing. You have to make it part of your day. And the biggest thing with patients who have had a stroke is to make things functional. Don't just sit there. Yes, there's a place for just strengthening where you do reps. But make things functional. Make it so that they can see themselves doing something that they want to be doing outside of your office. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's very important. And and so how quickly does this whole process start after a stroke or should it start after a stroke? Like once the patient's stable, you should pretty much start right away because you only, as you know, you only have a limited window of neuroplasticity where the brain is able to establish those new pathways where the brain is able to take on new skill sets. And, you know, the window does eventually close. What is that window? It's different for everybody. For some people, for me, it's almost like a never. The right. idea is if I can keep teaching you something new, but you are, there are times where you're most plastic, right. where you can right. regain the most before certain levels of tonicity or spasticity set in, but and which are a normal part of like the post-stroke, post-aneurysm process is that certain amount. But before they've really like changed your muscle length, before they've had much more of a permanence, you have an opportunity to improve it. So immediately, once you're stable, is really when you want to do uh, any kind of therapy. Right, right, right. And uh, in, and of course, we've seen this trend these these years where you know physical therapy starts in the hospital. It's, you know, as early as some folks are still in the ICU, they're getting a yeah. small amount of physical therapy. Yeah. As a student, I would treat patients in the ICU, like whether it's just passively moving body parts so they don't get contractures, mm-hmm. just to avoid bed sores, things of that nature. Still, like anything that you do right away doesn't make that part of the journey any less you know difficult or challenging or terrible it just makes the last part shorter gotcha and and of course a lot of you guys want to know you know i'm i'm seven months after a stroke i'm you know doing physical therapy uh do i still have the potential to improve and like gary's saying the answer is yes um you know traditional teaching of course is you know within six months to a year you get the most out of it but that doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that you will not get any better right it's what it means is that you see that's your you you need to really go hard on the first six to twelve months because that's the the time of plasticity that's the time the brain and the spinal cord really learn are able to relearn and create the new pathways yeah but you know what i tell my patients and you know you're you're the expert on that may may, i I hope i'm right is the more you do the better you'll do overall and Mm -hmm. the incremental gain is going to be less if it's a year or two out but it but it's uh but you always will be gaining no, you're absolutely right. There is always something to be had. There's always other ways to like learn something. You know, there's always a way around. There's an alternate strategy you right. can do. But you can always keep getting better. The biggest thing is to, like I said, point those things out because people get discouraged. Right. So you get a stroke patient with a weak arm um, and you get a stroke patient that's hemiplegic or whole side is not moving and they're not talking. So, of course... The severity of this, you know, there's no one size fits all when it comes to stroke. Right. How do you approach that from a therapist's perspective that you have all these different types of categories? How do you tailor it to every single one? Well, you got to see like what re- you always want to be realistic. You don't want to give your patient expectations that they're just not going to hit or are not within the realms of feasibility. So if the patient, I, I speak to them, I'll ask them, what would you like to get back first what is your biggest concern how can i address your biggest concern first like i want to walk without this chair i don't care if it's a walker i don't care if it's a cane i don't care whatever it is my biggest concern is being able to walk on my own i'm like all right so the biggest thing we're going to need is first i'm going to have to improve your just control your strength in your legs also your arms because right now at the very least you're going to need a rolling walker right and without that you know other arm working that's going to be a problem Forget that. You're going to fall. Right. So we got to come up with strategies and adaptive equipment that is the best for that person. And there are different adaptive devices that can actually go on to walkers. So like, let's say somebody doesn't really have use of the arm. You could still actually strap it in so it's actually weight-bearing through the whole forearm Mm -hmm. and keeps the humerus stabilized. And they could use the other hand and use this hand. It was almost like a separate weight-bearing instrument. Got it. And so you mentioned, I you said I asked the patient what their goals are uh, or what's the most important thing for them how 
That's that's amazing, uh, by the way, because because shared decision making and patient participation, I I personally think is very important in all aspects of care. But how important is it for physical therapy to be successful to get that buy in from the patient and to engage in exactly what you mentioned, asking those questions. Most of the time, the patients, you know, they go through a process just like anybody else. There's always that grief where first they're angry, then right. they're upset, then the, you know, just whatever yep. the steps yep. are for that particular person. By the time they get to me in an outpatient setting, they want to be there. Yeah. They want to be there. They want to get better. And I tell them, here's, and I get realistic goals and I give them realistic expectations because it is incredibly important that they succeed, especially early on. You have to show a patient success is possible, whether right. it's something small or not. It doesn't matter, but they need some kind of success because you can't just challenge and challenge and challenge. Right. You know, so. Are there, are there different phases in, in stroke rehab? Um, you know, more acute, less acute, more that's maintenance. More, yeah, that's more of an inpatient type thing, which is definitely not my specialty. I'm the outpatient therapist. Right. But there are different, definitely levels. There are limitations. There are, there's only so hard you could push a person. It also depends on the type of, you know, uh, neural condition that happened. Did they have an ischemia versus a hemorrhagic stroke? Mm-hmm. So if they had like a hemorrhagic stroke, obviously you don't want to go too hard on the patient and right. risk got to be the second one. Right, right, right. So, you know, it does, like you said before, it does have to be uh, tailored. And once they're an outpatient, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on their weight-bearing status. This is a big one. It also depends on their temperament, mental status, things of that nature. As you know, like a stroke can make somebody very impulsive. Mm-hmm. So they may need to go to an outpatient, but a specialized one where it's one-on-one for the whole time, like an hour of one-on-one, because this patient might decide to get up and go to the bathroom because they think they can just get up by themselves and walk to the bathroom. And then before you know it, you have a patient, you know, possibly falling. Right. That's a bigger issue. Right, right, right. So speaking, let's get a little bit more specific about the, the, if you can, about the, 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 uh, rehabilitation involved in stroke care. Of course, there's different patients, different, uh, deficits, but are there common exercises you use when it comes to stroke? Um, common techniques, maybe? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I like to do, uh, and this is again me being an outpatient, like orthopedic type, uh, you know, centered, I'd say, therapist, is I want to give the patient the ability to get everything they need. So, in other words, from a musculoskeletal side. Right. So, if they have an incredible amount of tightness, and very little control and a lot of weakness in their leg, it's not realistic for me to really train them in walking right. if I know that they can't support themselves or they're going to fatigue immediately or they can't handle a transfer. So I'd like to at least make sure that they have the base. And that starts with their strength, flexibility, things of that nature. Once we're there, I try to incorporate function in everything. But once I have at least a place, they're at a place where they're comfortable and uncomfortable with the amount of strength they have, amount of flexibility they have. I go for almost complete function. Nothing but like weight bearing transfers, walking exercises, balance, things of that nature. I'm not really interested if a person can do, you know, kick their leg 30 times, especially no. if that's not their goal in life. Their goal in life is to get up from a chair. Okay. How do I come up with an exercise? Great exercise. Squat. Yeah. Yeah. Forces them to use balance, forces them to use strength, forces them to use everything. Yeah, I love this approach to not really think of, oh, you know, I'm trying to get the function of this foot stronger versus I'm, I'm trying to achieve a goal, a functional outcome. And yeah. that, that might be a more holistic approach to the problem versus just focusing on one thing that might not be that pertinent or relative exactly. to like the patient. Exactly. A lot of therapists, they, uh, especially, you know, when I was younger, I would definitely have a different mindset where I saw individual challenges versus a complete picture yeah yeah very 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 important um and you mentioned balance um of course you know a balance and falls are a big problem when it comes to stroke patients also elderly patients but um is there are there specific exercises to improve somebody's balance um to prevent falls yeah absolutely uh different studies have shown different things like simple things like can you stand on one leg with your eyes closed for 10 seconds? Right. 
if you uh, and it's a sliding scale based on age, but if you're over fifty and you can't do that, you have something like a fifty percent increased chance of falling. If you you know, and then obviously as you get older, if there's like certain tests that we do, and one of them is called the four step square test. If you can't do this in X amount of time, studies have shown that you are statistically much more likely to fall. And falling is the number one cause of death and a preventable cause of death in adults age 65 or older. Right, right, right. So we actually do give uh, our company, Jack PT, full disclosure, I work for Jack PT. <laughs> we actually give lectures on fall prevention, how to walk on certain services, uh, how to, you know, uh, do exercises safely in order to do that. And I always tell patients, like, look, the easiest thing you can do, stand on one leg, close your eyes, put your hands right over a counter. Right over a counter. So you prevent a fall. It, it will improve your balance tremendously. Everybody thinks of balance as this innate uh, skill. Mm -hmm. You either have it or you don't. No, it's completely a learned activity. You practice it, you will get better. You don't have a choice. You just will get better at it. Right. It's like throwing a ball, playing golf, doing anything. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. And, you know, we do see a lot of patients that have chronic issues with balance, um, often as a result of a stroke in an area of the brain that affects balance. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we typically send them for a vestibular therapy. Is that yep. what you're describing? Partially. Vestibular deals more with, like, the ear. But this is more like a proprioception, we call it. Got it. It's basically your brain gets the information from receptors and, you know, the similar ligaments on length and the tendons on tension. And based on that, it only accounts for about 10% of your spatial orientation. But when your, let's say, vision is uh, compromised because of a CVA, a mm -hmm. stroke, or a part of your brain that controls it is compromised, your body will depend much more on it okay. because you might have altered vision, you might have altered you know, perception. So now your brain is actually relying on that. And if you could strengthen that system, it'll compensate for the sum of what you lost during the stroke. Right, right, right. That's that's amazing. So speaking of techniques, is there is there a role? I mean, there's a lot of things, of course, as technology is improving and people get excited about everything new technological. Is there a role for virtual reality or robotics uh, in in stroke rehabilitation. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of publications out there, but what's your take on it? My, my take is it's got to be the right patient. Okay. If it's not the right patient, it's, you know, then you're not doing anybody any favors. First of all, these technologies are incredibly expensive. Right. So they're not always widely available to the public at large. Right now, the majority of them are in a test setting. I know that it's being done at a few different hospitals, both locally to us in Long Island, as well as Manhattan and northern New Jersey, but they're for a very specific uh, population group. And for some people, it's possible. For some people, it's not possible just because of the limitations of both the patient and the technology. I think that it will absolutely have a place, but I think it has to be applied very selectly. It can't be, it's got to be a scalpel, not a broadsword. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that approach. Let's talk a little bit about how uh, therapy affects daily life for these patients. And of course, you mentioned you, you have goal-oriented care where you set a particular function that's important to them and you go after it. Um, is, is that your priority? Do you focus on getting all the activities of daily living mm. uh, as kind of the first thing that you try to get patients to be able to achieve? To a large extent, uh, one group of uh, rehab specialists that I work closely with are occupational therapists. Right. And they are amazing at very specific skill sets. Things that, you know, wouldn't even occur to me, they are fantastic at, like getting you to button your shirt, especially fine motor stuff. They are much better than I'll ever be at that. So all the credit <laughs> in the world, there is absolutely, like, they're a vital part of the rehab process. And what I try to do is I focus on, like, starting simple. Right. Start simple. Get off the chair. Right. Get off a toilet by yourself. Right. Stuff that we take for granted. But for somebody that has just gone out of the hospital and had to call a nurse every time they wanted to, you know, do something, that probably embarrassed them a little bit. Right. If I can give them back just that little modicum of independence, uh, means everything in the world. Yeah, it makes all the difference. Yeah. And, and so so you have some folks maybe that are discouraged by the process, they're not seeing yeah. the progress they want, whatever the, 
you know, they're discouraged because they're high-functioning individual and now all of a sudden they cannot move, they cannot talk or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, how do you motivate these folks? You know, it's it, it, I personally find it tough when I see them in the office, but Absolutely. you know, you, you work with them closely, you're trying to get them back to being better. Maybe they don't see the progress they want. How do you motivate them? Well, first they have to kind of <laughs> get to a place in life where they accept that this has happened, that they're not a different person. It's not like that's not you anymore. That's a different version of you. You know, I used to be able to dunk a basketball. <laughs> not that I'm comparing having a stroke to not being able to dunk a basketball. It would be very I never clear. was able to do that. So okay. It's not that great. <laughs> it's, it's all right. It's all right. But they have to at least be at peace with what had happened. They right. have to be at peace with a possible limitation on them. Once they're there, then their mentality and their mindset switches from almost recovery to maximization. Yeah, so but that goes back to what we were talking about before. People have to get a win. They have to get a victory here and there. It doesn't matter how big, it doesn't matter how small, but you also have to be able to recognize it because they might not. Right. Because to them, they're going to be like, what's the big deal? This is stuff I always used to do. Right. Like, yes, it is. But when was the last time you did it before today? Right, right, right. And so that's, I guess, uh, something to be said about expectation management, right? Yes. Um, how important is that in, in your rehabilitation Incredibly sure, important. Yeah. Honestly, uh, in every aspect of rehab, it's incredibly important. Especially even in orthopedics, patients go into an operation, and a lot of people, especially an older generation, they have this impression that they're there getting surgery. Surgery is the last resort. So if they're getting surgery, that means that when surgery is over, everything is fixed. Right. Yeah, no, this is where you come in. It's like, you know, your surgeon built you a house. That doesn't mean you could live in it. You still got to make it yours. You still yeah. got to personalize it. You got to do all the work to make it yours and make it, you know, comfortable and livable and what you want it to be. And that's what rehab is. It's you making yourself where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's so insightful. Um, so, so you see a lot of these patients, of course, all the time. What are maybe the top challenges that you've encountered while, while you're trying to, uh, uh, to work with these folks? Well, um, a lot of times patients, because of the injury, they have this, like, impulsivity. Okay. And you have to understand, you are going to repeat yourself a lot. A lot. Right. And not every therapist is built for that. Some therapists, they want to work with only athletes, or it's like you tell them once, it's done. Yeah. That's not life. Yeah. Well, yeah. At least it's not my life. Especially <laughs> not rehab life, not stroke rehab life. No, certainly not. And that's just like one part of it. And then on top of that, you have to be able to understand that things aren't going to go as planned. You might have a plan in your head. There is no schedule, though. Right. There is no schedule. You have a, you know, you have a vague outline. You have yeah. A, you have a plan for a plan, but it's going to go how it's going to go. you got to be able to pivot. you got to be able to move. And every once in a while, like if you had a rough couple of sessions, you might need to take a step back and get this person to win. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's actually, what you mentioned is very important for you guys listening to us. Everybody has their own timetable, right? You take two patients that have the same stroke in the same area of the brain, the same part is affected, they're going to have a different rehabilitation recovery journey. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and so if you compare yourself in a support group, for example, you compare yourself to other patients in the support group and you see, you know, Miss Jones did better than me. She's improving much faster. What's wrong with me? What, um, it, it, everybody's wired differently and the, the way everybody's brain recovers is differently. And yeah. you got to trust the process and be motivated. And, and uh, the more you do, the better you'll end up being. 100%. I tell people, I always try to make it relatable. Like I tell them, motion creates emotion. Right. If you're getting up and you're moving, you're going to be happier about it because you're going to feel like you accomplished something. Right. If you sit and wait for the three days a week, you're going to see me. It's going to be a long time between those visits. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it comes back to the homework aspect of things. Absolutely. Thing. And do you see any difference between younger and older patients in their response to physical therapy after stroke always? Older patients tend to just even put in like a little bit more effort. They seem to like kind of come to terms with what's happened a little bit sooner. Okay. And they, you know, 
both are very appreciative. They just seem to have a mentality where it's like, all right, next step. Right. Younger patients, just because it is much more rare in a younger population, it is. it's tougher. It's also generally patients tend to be a little bit bigger, so they're tougher to work with just as far as safety goes. But they both want to get better. That's the commonality. And it's it's usually just emotionally, um, it, it, at least in my experience, it's tougher on uh, the younger population because it's just much more rare. So it feels like a why me situation. No question. Yeah. And, and what about any long term strategies that you give your patients in terms of maintaining the gains they've achieved from physical therapy? Um, is it strategies that you give them in terms of giving them exercises to do at home or more so mm-hmm. mental support and uh, motivation? Well, it's like you said, it, it starts with that. It's exercises, it's staying active. It is the mental portion of it because they, the more that they could do that at whatever they used to do or whatever was a normal part of their life, they're going to feel better about. Right. The closer that they get to just regular uh, pre what we call pre morbid status, mm-hmm. the better off they're going to be because they're going to not see themselves as a, a stroke patient, but a patient who had a stroke, right? right and right. put it in the past tense. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to see it. Yeah. And Gary, not to put you on the spot before oh. we go into the patient questions, um, but I will. <laughs> All right, uh, fine. Give me give me an example of one or two memorable patient experiences that you've had in the stroke realm, where you know you learned something maybe, or where you saw something amazing happen before your eyes, or something that changed you by doing this. That's a great question. The amazing part for me is always when the patient kind of sees the victory. When I point something out to them and they're like, oh, crap. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I forget part of my language, but I can't believe. We're good. Oh, my God. You, you just did that. Uh, it was a patient that you had sent to me. Um, he w- didn't think that he could walk. Like, what do you mean you can't walk? Do me a favor. I just, you know, did a quick gross motor test just to see if he had at least the, the, the gross motor strength right. to do something. He got up. That was a little bit of a surprise. He's stood up before, and they're like, oh, should we get the walker? I'm like, no. No. I, like, I don't know if the camera's adds a few tons, but I'm, I'm just over 6'4 and about 300 pounds. So he felt... You can handle it. Yeah. He, he was probably like 5'10, maybe a buck 80. So the guy was almost half my, just over half my size. Right. So, you know, I grabbed the hold of his belt. He stood up and then we walked. First, I walked like directly in front of him. It looked like the world's, you know, most awkward dance. <laughs> and then I was like, all right, this time I'm going to stand behind you. You're going to keep your eyes up because trust me, there's nothing interesting on the floor. That's one thing I always <laughs> tell patients. I'm like, I checked. There's no money down there. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And he walked and... It's always amazing because you see the look on their loved one's face. Right. You know, that look That look is hope. Yeah. They're like, I didn't think I'd see this. Right. Because all they've seen is acute care. And in acute care, you don't want that person getting up too much. Right, right, right. For, for obviously safety reasons. Right, right. But all of a sudden, somebody just, you know, they just saw their loved one walk on their own again. And that shows them that there is a light. There is hope. And uh, you know this person... Uh, w, I'm, I'm the worst human in the world with names. Um, I won't even mention it. That I'm, no, no, no. Yeah. Please don't, because they're probably watching. <laughs> um, he knows who he is. Yeah, exactly. So um, um, that's that's really amazing, and uh, you know that's certainly why we all do what we do, right? In, yeah. in oh, medicine, because yeah. because you want to see those reactions. That's really, really spectacular. So why did you become a physical therapist? What what what? How did you? hear about physical therapy was it a role model in your life was it an experience sort of yeah i uh when i was uh, 16 i had some kind of neurovirus destroy my long thoracic nerve in oh, my no right way. shoulder you had a winged scapula i did have a very winged scapula very good <laughs> and uh they had no idea why yeah they thought first uh, they gave me like bioxin for lyme disease mm-hmm. i remember that because it was you know pill was bigger than me <laughs> uh, but the way it, um, they had I was in MRIs they did blood work uh, the whole nine yards and at the end of the day the best thing that they could come up with is you had some kind of virus 
Right. Attack this nerve. Now you have a wing scapula. And I, the only reason I noticed is because I started working out. Obviously, I stopped a long time ago. But my shoulder blade would rub against the inside of my uh, skin. And I'd have black and blues on my shoulder. Wow. And one day, my dad just saw my back. And he was like, Gary, what the heck happened? Did you get into a fight? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and that's how I found out that I was even back there. I thought I was just wow. weak because I couldn't, you know, I was trying to do a bench press and I couldn't. Right. Turns out I was weak and I had a wing scapula. <laughs> and um, this uh, neurologist based out of, uh, I think oh, I think he's in Glen Cove. Uh, I'm not sure if he still practices. He sent me to a physical therapist and I was in PT for like five, six months. Okay. Trying to get my shoulder strength back. And it was in my dominant arm. And uh, I enjoyed the process. I always love science. Yeah, I always love science. I love biology. I adjunct it at Stony Brook. I, I enjoy physiology. It just seemed like a really good fit. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, thank God for that because yeah. uh, now you're enjoying what you do and you're helping people. So uh, that's, I love that's it. spectacular. 15 years. I love it. That's awesome. Well, Jason, I'm going to uh, punch you off the Yeah, in. take over. Yeah, I was, I was captivated. Uh, that was really great. And, and you oh, know, I you. deal with a lot of the patients in the support group. Yeah. And you've, you've answered a lot of the, the questions. You. Um, you know, like you say, that the milestones are, are what's important. Do you recommend having like a, a journal or a video journal like Absolutely. for family members? Absolutely. Uh, just so you, you know what, because everybody needs to be reminded every once in a while of how far they come. The big One of the things that people lose on of something that has like, you're talking a timeline of months and years, mm -hmm. is perspective. You need to see where you were compared to where you uh, are going, where you've mm -hmm. been, where you're at. You want to see those steps along the way just to know that, hey, you're still, like, there's an entry from a week ago. The stroke was seven months ago, and you have an entry of something new you just noticed that you can do that you didn't a week ago. Mm -hmm. And it reminds you, you are still improving. So absolutely, I love that idea. Yeah, and I think it's better for the family members or the caregivers to kind of keep that because I see a lot of the patients are get very hard on themselves mm -hmm. or don't want to admit, yeah. like, oh, this is something, you know, because they don't take it as a win. Yeah. something minute to them where it's really not you're absolutely right people look at it as a almost like in at least in my gym class like pass fail like <sighs> it's like all or nothing like it's not that it's not you either are 100 percent or you're zero mm -hmm. there's a whole road and it's you know it needs to be done like you can't just go from zero to 100 yeah. it just doesn't exist now with the the caregivers themselves what can they do to be more supportive or in your experience, what have they done to be a detriment to the process? Well, sometimes, and in my experience, the only time that it's ever been really detrimental is when they don't have a well-defined perspective or a well-defined set of expectations. Mm. And they think that I read this Google has been like one of the biggest banes to the medical community. <laughs> we feel it's, you. Yeah, because the thing is, in my experience, people look at, you know, Google reviews, things like that. They've either had the most amazing experience, like miraculous, or they've had a terrible experience. And that's maybe like 3 4% on either side of the curve. Right. The other 90 to 95% have very textbook experience. Mm -hmm. And the people that read those amazing stories as well as those terrible stories they base their expectations on that versus what is reality and that makes it tough because they've experienced the trauma whether themselves or through their loved one and now they're experiencing another set of disappointment let's call it or something along those lines mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the biggest thing a person can be is patient right. especially with their loved one that person is not lazy is not not trying enough in the most part believe me they want it more than they do mm -hmm. because somebody who had a, a, a regular even an average level of independence wants nothing more than to regain that independence they don't want it to be a burden they don't want to feel whether they are or not it doesn't matter they don't want to feel like it so you know just be patient that person wants that return to as close to normalcy as they can more than you do so there you go. So I have to ask, uh, in your experience, are, are males or females better patients? And, and I'll tell you why based upon what, what I've seen. That's, a <laughs> that's, that's unfortunate question. 
Um, I have found honestly fairly equal. There's never I, I don't recall any experiences that really kind of like shaped it one way or another. Okay. I have noticed that I, I've had much more male patients than female patients. Oh wow, okay. Yeah, we, we see in the support group a lot of times the, the men are either too hard on themselves yeah. because they were the, the caregivers for so long for the family, yeah. you know, the breadwinner or, yeah. you know. Well, I could see that, yeah. Yeah, and then they, they have a hard time now either being taken care of or coming to terms with, like you had said earlier, it's almost like the, the new normal. Well, that's the thing. Like, a lot of times, especially in older generation, I'm sure, like, you know, obviously in this field, like, mm -hmm. it's skewed toward the older side. They have a more, you know, uh, like, let's call it a classic kind of view on things where, like, I'm the man, I'm supposed to be strong, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be providing, I'm supposed to all do all this. They're supposed to be, like, the foundation, mm -hmm. or they're supposed to be the bedrock, and now they're not. So they have this, they've associated their value, especially if they're done working, if they're retired, mm -hmm. with that level of independence, with the fact that, you know, I could do whatever I want now, and now if that gets taken away from them, it's very hard for them to come to terms with that. Yeah. And with the younger ones, I've seen that because they are still the breadwinner or the, the main income, now it's a financial aspect yeah. that is compounding the situation. Yeah, yeah. I could, you know, very easily see that because... Oh, yeah. You know, uh, especially with young, you know, young males, it's like when you're 18, you don't really have much yet. Right. You know. You also think you're invincible. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All of a sudden, you go from what is supposed to be, you know, the prime of your life to now you're dependent on somebody else for a lot of mm -hmm. stuff that you took completely as granted. Just, right. you know, and now it's not. Mm-hmm. So it's hard, you know, I could, I could see like where it's coming from. Yeah, for sure. And no matter what, at the end of the day, they're, like they're gonna look at me at somebody that's like, ah, what do you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you don't know what I'm going through. I'm like, no, not personally. I could empathize, I could sympathize, but I can't relate directly. But I could tell you, you're not reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. You're not the first person I'm having this conversation with, I hope, you know, I hope like, you know, nobody else ever has a stroke, but I know you won't go to be my last. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to talk about it, you want to be upset with me, you want to resent me, you want to resent your significant other, you can. But, you know, it doesn't, you know, advance the plot. Now, so. going into that, when you have patients that, like, seem to hit that wall for whatever reason, what advice do you give them and the, the caregivers that are part of that process? My advice is usually, like, find a win. Like, mm -hmm. you know, take a step back and let's set them up for success in something. Whether it's something simple like going for a swim, because they're in that water, depending on, obviously, the degree of the injury to the brain, mm -hmm. they're going to be a lot more likely to be successful in a more weighted, unweighted environment. Mm -hmm. So something like that, can be incredibly you know beneficial and honestly depending on like the amount of control they have obviously they're gonna forget for a few minutes mm -hmm. and they're gonna feel like they're doing what they want to do so my advice is set the person up for a win so they feel like at least they're still progressing that there's still victories to be had you know that's, that's good. Um, one last uh, question. Um, we see a lot of, um, I guess, more inpatient places have like that house car kind of set up. Yeah. Do you do you think how how beneficial do you think that is, and yeah. do, you, do you think that everybody's going to go that route eventually? I think those are going to be more in specialized uh, rehabilitation facilities. I think they're the more you could mimic mm -hmm. real life, the better off you'll be. Uh, a lot of hospitals have an actual like dummy car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Outside, mm -hmm. you got to show that you can get in there. Yeah. The same way, like you know, if you're if you've had surgery and you've been out, you don't leave until you've gone to the bathroom. Right. 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 If you're leaving the hospital, mm -hmm. I want to make sure you could at least do this because if, let's say, you're a two hundred and fifty pound man. And, you know, the orderlies, the nurse, whomever, they help you into the, your car. Now you go back home, and it's your 120-pound child, spouse, 
whichever, are you going to be able to get in and out of that car safely with just that one person assisting you? Mm-hmm. So those things are definitely necessary. Just so you know, peace of, have peace of mind that, yeah, I know my patient could get in the house safely. Now, is it 100%? No. But at the very least, you know I've seen him, her, whomever be able to do it, and it wasn't just luck. They were like, okay, I reach for here. I step out here. This person grabs me by the belt here. We get up. We go. You know that they know in their head what they're doing, Mm -hmm. and they have at least the very capability to do it safely and correctly. And You've done everything in your power to make sure that they have success and they are are safe, and just don't make anything worse. So, yeah, those those, uh, setups are very necessary. Yeah, I, I, I would think so, but from not somebody who never, you know, experienced or saw a patient in them, yeah. they sound fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, the fact that you can, you know, try to get in and out of the bathtub or try to even, some of them go detailed to have a washer and dryer. Yeah. To try to load them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I, think, I think it's fantastic, but I just didn't know how practical it was. It, it's because one of the things that limits every practice, especially outpatient, is mm-hmm. space. Yeah. It's real estate. How much space do you have? And these things take up a lot of space. They do. And it's not like you can use them for 10 different things. They're highly specific. So, you know, you have a thing that mimics a car, that mimics a washer, or dryer. You're taking up a lot of space. So I could understand. You'll see places that where uh, CVAs, the strokes, are a big part of what they treat. They'll have those there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have a neuro center in Franklin Square that has a lot of specialized equipment. I'm right over here, you know, things like walking bars, parallel bars. Mm-hmm. Not every outpatient practice is going to have that because if it's not a big enough part of yeah. the, their population base, right? then you're taking up a lot of space for a very specialized piece of equipment. Yeah, and I've also seen like a gurney kind of system yeah. that yeah. they harness, they can put the patients in. Harnesses, yep. Yeah, I mean, I think that's fantastic. And, and from yeah. what I hear, the patients that have actually got to experience and use them, then you don't have to worry if you have the four foot eight uh, little therapist mm-hmm. with you and you're a bigger guy, you know, you're afraid I'm, I'm going to kill this person. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And I, I like it because especially if you're doing like a let's say a treadmill, Mm -hmm. and you have a treadmill that can support the person's body weight, because the thing with a treadmill is the treadmill doesn't know you've stopped, unless, like, (laughs) obviously you pull the pin. Like, the the treadmill's going to do what treadmills do, and they're Mm going to keep spinning. So while you may want to stop, the treadmill might not. Mm -hmm. So when you have that, you know, uh, uh, system that could support the person's body weight, there's an element of safety where you can be a a little bit maybe more aggressive. I think patients also get more aggressive because they have that in their head a little bit, they're a little bit secure. And that's the thing. I kind of feel like that could be like a double-edged sword Mm. because, you know, you're going to remember, oh, wow, I remember I had the treadmill up at, you know, five and a half or six miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you did, even though you missed seven steps out of ten. But they remember that they had it up there, Mm -hmm. and now they're going to try to do something because they have it in their head that they were able to do it under the 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 fact that they were under these very specific circumstances. They forget they had the system. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. That's why I try to keep everything as realistic as possible, just so that way they don't develop these kind of like scenario moments that's in interesting head. there's definitely two sides to every coin yeah well well gary that's that's all very fascinating we really appreciate you thanks coming here thank today. you for having me it was it was really a treat and i i hope you guys uh enjoyed it again gary nope. thank, thank you, you doc uh like i said i hope you guys enjoyed it and i'm sure we're going to have more rehabilitation uh, topics and and podcasts coming up very very important part of uh, stroke uh, and uh, uh and recovery from stroke yeah. Uh, Please, if you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll catch you again on another video. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.